American innovation. Our topic today is going to be the birth of the digital age, specifically uh, the microchip. And so uh, uh, I'm Scott Turner. I'm director of science programs here at the NAS. Uh, I'm not your usual host for American innovation. That's David Randall, of course, uh, but he was unable to uh, join us today. And so I'm uh, stepping in to fill in. Um, I'd just like to give you a, uh, a brief uh, overview of what we'll be doing today. We, we have three distinguished speakers who will be telling us about uh, the history of the microchip and what went into its, um, its invention and eventual uh, um, implementation and the, and the transformative nature of the microchip, uh, obvious to everyone, but we're going to hear some interesting historical details today. Um, we have uh, uh, three distinguished speakers. Uh, I'll introduce them momentarily, but uh, this, of course, is a webinar for uh, you, the audience, as well. And so um, what we'll be doing is there are three speakers. We'll have short presentations. Um, I would like to encourage uh, all of you to all of you in the audience. If you have questions, by all means, put them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We can also take questions in the chat box as well. But we like the Q&A uh, uh, box just because it's a little bit more interactive. Um, our presentations will go for about 45 minutes. And after that, we will have another 45 minutes uh, allowed for uh, Q&A from uh, you, the audience. I'll be moderating those. And uh, I just like to mention that uh, you don't need to wait until we get into the Q&A part of the discussion today to post your questions. They, you can post them in at any time as they uh, as they arise in your mind and so forth. So uh, with that, let's uh, go on to the main event. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us today. Our speakers uh, today are, uh, as I said, three distinguished uh, 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 contributors to the history of what's arguably the most important invention of uh, all time, uh, namely the transistor and the microchip. Uh, first out of the blocks will be Dr. David Laws, who is the semiconductor curator at the Computer History Museum. Uh, he advises the museum's permanent collection and exhibits. He records oral histories. He writes on the history of technology, and he served as staff director for various semiconductor companies in Silicon Valley in the UK, and he's played roles there ranging from engineer to CEO, including at such prominent uh, firms as Fairchild, Advanced Micro Devices, and Altera, and he's been doing this for nearly 50 years. Our second uh, guest today is Dr. Uh, Luke Bauer. Uh, he's a partner in the venture capital firm of ND Capital, and he has 40 years of experience in building companies across the semiconductor industry. Uh, he uh, holds the PhD in engineering science from Caltech, and today he often writes on themes related to science, geopolitics, and history from his residence in Maui. Sounds like a pretty nice place. And then our final speaker today is going to be uh, Mr. T.R. Reed. He's an author and a reporter for the Washington Post, and he's also a regular guest on NPR's Morning Edition. Uh, he formerly served as the paper's bureau chief in Tokyo and London, and he's written over a dozen books. And several of these, uh, including The Chip, uh, The United States of Europe, and the Healing of America, who have become national bestsellers. He's also uh, chair of the board of the Colorado Coalition, Coalition for the Homeless and chairman of the Colorado Foundation for Universal Healthcare. Uh, gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to uh, today's uh, NAS uh, webinar uh, in American Innovation. And um, we'll, um, we're really going to look forward to hearing uh, about this uh, remarkable invention. <coughs> Excuse me. So... Uh, David, you're, I beg your pardon, you're going to uh, be, be leading off the presentations today, so take it away. Okay, let's <clears throat> share the screen here. Okay, so... 
If you rely on the popular press, you'll get the impression that the microchip was invented in a burst of activity in the late 1950s by just two people, Jack Kilby at Texas Instruments and Robert Noyce at Fairchild Semiconductor. But in his Nobel Prize lecture, Jack Kilby uh, kindly acknowledged the efforts of the legions of researchers who created the foundation that led to their success. So in answering the questions that are posed by the NIS, the organizers of this webinar, I'd like to introduce you to some of these individuals and their contributions. Let's start way back with the first inklings of a semiconductor. It came up in 1833 when Michael Faraday uh, describes an extraordinary effect. And one thing you'll notice here, this is a wide international activity in, in bringing this technology to birth. Ferdinand Braun in Germany discovered the semiconductor diode in 1874, and Jagdish Chandra Bose patented the diode for detecting radio waves um, in Calcutta, then part of India, in 1901. And the, the, one of the first descriptions of a transistor's use was came from Julius Lillenfeld, who was a Polish engineer working in the United States back as early as 1926. And Alan Wilson, um, an English uh, physicist working in Leipzig, Germany, explained how semiconductors worked in 1931. During the 1930s, AT&T, the telephone company, uh, was getting concerned about the amount of power, the uh, fragility, and uh, issues with using uh, vacuum tubes in their switching systems. And they put together a group of engineers and uh, scientists under William Shockley uh, to try to figure out a way to use semiconductors to come up with a better method of uh, controlling their switching systems. Um, he started in 1939, uh, where he wrote down for the first time that he had figured out how he thought a semiconductor could be used um, in replacement of a vacuum tube. Uh, his work was interrupted uh, by the war through, but picked up again in 1947. Uh, in 1945, and then late in December 1947, uh, two uh, scientists working under him, John Bardeen and Walter Bratton, uh, basically produced transistor action in a germanium point contact device. Recognizing that that particular structure was not very reproducible, uh, Shockley uh, went off and by himself conceived an improved structure uh, based on a theoretical understanding of the PN junction effect uh, in 1948, and that in, and that was announced by a lad shortly after. Jack Morton, who was manufacturing manager for the transistor assembly line in Bell Labs, um, really came up with one of the first written discussions of uh, putting multiple transistors on a chip to build what we now call a microchip. Although he said, uh, we do not know the technology of doing these things, but here is the challenge. And this was just two years after the invention of the transistor. By 1952, Jeffrey Dummer from the Telecommunications Research Establishment in, English, in England felt that uh, finally it seemed possible that it could be achieved. Um, it now seems possible to division electronic equipment in a solid block with no connecting wires. And that's probably one of the best descriptions you can have of uh, a microchip. Many scientists throughout the world started working to try to uh, bring this idea to fruition. And as early as 1953, Harwick Johnson at RCA Labs in New Jersey actually built a phase shift oscillator circuit on a single piece of germanium. So four years before Jack Kilby built the chart, uh, Harry Johnson had a working integrated circuit. He continued work in the lab there and together with Tolko Walmart in 57, uh, under a contract with the US Air Force, they built a, a series of fully integrated circuits, including a shift register, which is the device shown under the microscope here. Uh, more than RCA, there was work going on in uh, uh, IBM Poughkeepsie Labs, where Rick Dill built a single chip uh, four stage counter in 1954. And a similar device came out of Bell Labs in 1955, a full four stage ring counter replacing eight transistors and dozens of other devices. So integrated circuits were around before Jack Kilby's device. However, Kilby's significant contribution to the work was uh, 
all the previous devices were special purpose products with very limited applications, and it was difficult to come up with a general purpose solution. Uh, Jack uh, discovered, uh, who was actually hired by TI to try to uh, miniaturize the products they were working on, uh, pursued a more general purpose solution, and he basically showed that it was possible to uh, build uh, a, a complete electronic function uh, using all semiconductors. This device that uh, he showed in September 1958, basically a proof of concept vehicle, um, was a phase shift oscillator circuit, essentially the same one Harry Johnson had made uh, several years before. But as uh, Bob Bergman, who worked for Kilby at the time, uh, observed, clearly this a fragile device was not production worthy. Uh, but we heard about a startup company in California that had come up with something called planar technology that might just be what we needed. That company, of course, was Fairchild Semiconductor, where Swiss uh, physicist John Nee had come up with a new approach to making transistors. Earlier devices were built vertically with exposed junctions, and it was impossible to then lay any other material over the top. His solution was a device called a planar device that we'll probably hear more about from Luke when he describes uh, process technology. Um, but it was all on one flat surface covered by an insulating layer of silicon oxide. And when Bob Noyce, who at that time was uh, in charge of R&D at Fairchild, took a look at it, he realized it would be possible to make interconnections by depositing metal directly on top of that as part of the manufacturing process. So he came up with a solution to uh, Kilby's separate pieces by using Herney's planar process. His first idea was implemented by uh, many other technologies. On top of uh, Herney's planar process, Gordon Moore came up with a method of interconnecting using aluminum interconnect. And Jay Last, another of the founders of Semiconductor, and a whole team of people came up with isolation and implementation of the chip that we see on the right, which was the first working monolithic integrated circuit produced in May 1960 at Fairchild in Mount View. That device was the basis of a whole family of products that Fairchild introduced over the next year, they, a whole family of uh, integrated building blocks, including flip-flops, shift registers, pieces of adders, and the item in the middle that they called the G-Gate, uh, was selected for NASA's Apollo guidance computer and was the first major um, program to uh, employ integrated circuits. Um, it, there were others uh, that actually flew before Apollo, but uh, this was a significant factor in boosting the wide use of circuits in applications outside of aerospace and uh, military applications. Okay, why am I not advancing? More, Gordon Moore at Fairchild, looking uh, after several years of chips, realized that there was a significant increase in complexity being built into each of the chips over the year, and just plotting the uh, increase in density with time over five years worth of chips, he drew a line in 1965 that uh, predicted that we'd be able to get 65,000 transistors on a chip within 10 years. And his observation became a self-fulfilling prophecy that continues today. And uh, about the same time that Gordon was making this prediction, uh, Ed Sack and a number of other people at Westinghouse on the East Coast actually came up with the idea that it might be possible to put a computer on a single chip. Um, to accomplish that, it took the efforts of major organizations throughout the world, but three of the heroes who solved uh, the ability to put more and more transistors on a chip using a new technology called MOS, the metal oxide semiconductor, um, came the invention of the, the first practical working device came from Bell Labs in 1960. Uh, RCA came up with the first, probably the first integrated circuit in 1961. And the folks at Fairchild solved 
Andy Grove, Bruce Deal, and Edward Snow solved the stability issues that allowed it to become a mainstream technology. Many people then started using MOS to come up with faster, smaller, cheaper chips. Um, and one of the early pioneers in this area was Lee Boy Cell at Fairchild, who came up with a big chunk of, an, uh, of a CPU in 1966. Um, he didn't call that um, a microprocessor at the time because, as he claimed, it lacked internal multi-state sequencing capability, but he added that into a new chip developed out of this one at four phase in 1969, and this is one of the claims to be the first microprocessor. Meanwhile, Steve Geller and Ray Holter, Garrett Air Research, were building some massively complex chips for the time and came up with a microprocessor chipset complete com comprising six different chips. Uh, but what we generally recognize as the first complete computer, even though it's very basic on a single device, came out of Intel with the 4004 processor in 1971, uh, followed that same year by the first 8-bit processor. And at this time, we were getting about just over 3,000 devices on a chip. Uh, TI were also working in this area. Gary Boone built that, that same 8-bit processor in 1971 and went on to use that as the basis for many important developments in the area of microcomputers. So this is a plot of the increase in complexity of each of the different microprocessors introduced over the next through 2020, where you can see now we're looking at chips with over 50 million transistors on the device uh, capable of performing quite extraordinary activities in computing control and communications. Mm -hmm. Another way of looking at this is based on this timeline of semiconductors that I developed several years ago for uh, the uh, Computer History Museum, where the website shows kind of visually a sense of these are not to scale, obviously, going from one transistor on a chip in the 1950s up to one of the largest chips being built today from NVIDIA, uh, an artificial intelligence oriented GPU with 150 billion transistors on the chip. So thank you. That's my presentation. Thanks very much, David. Uh, uh, I saw in, in one of your earlier slides that this whole the whole thing started off with what you what was described as uh, one of David one of uh, Faraday's remarkable observations. Uh, uh, just what was that observation? He was working with some materials that he I think it was possibly a, a lead sulfide or something like that, and the it went the opposite direction in terms of its resistivity with temperature than he had expected. Yeah, he was okay. never able to explain that. We later recognized, of course, it was a semiconductor effect. Okay, all right, all right. Well, I'm sure there are gonna be more questions. Uh, there are some actually coming up here on the Q&A right now. Uh, so we'll come back to those uh, later. So our uh, next up is gonna be Luke Bauer. Um, so take it away, David, or Luke. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, I will base my remark on the on a book that uh, that Marshall Wilder and myself wrote a few years ago, um, called "The Microchip uh, Revolution: A Brief History." Um, next, please. Basically, the, the book was based on a dozen of interviews of uh, key executive and founders of uh, nine companies that uh, either we worked for or knew very well. And also we selected on the basis of unusual or interesting products, technologies, and manufacturing strategies. The period uh, covered is uh, limited to 1965 to 1995. And um, you know, both of us were process engineers. So you have to keep that in mind. We are kind of, uh, People actually making making the wafers, so and, and living and for years and living in the trenches, if you want. So I think uh, everything we say is naturally uh, is biased by by this experience. Next slide, please. So thank you very much, David, for your presentation, which starts in eighteen thirty three. I guess I 
I started in 1947 with a point contact German in transistors, as you well said, was invented by Bardin, Breton, and Shockley at Bell Lab. And then going uh, fast forward um, at Fairchild in 1959, I think this was an absolutely key invention of Jean Ernie with a planar process. Although a lot of beautiful work had been made by Mohamed Atala at uh, at Bell Lab as far as passive aging. So that gets that goes somewhat together, and I think uh, David Lewis is right to point in the contribution of so many different people that it's hard to give uh, you know who was really the originator or what. But um, at the same time, uh, Robert Noyes then invented the integrated circuits, and at, and it was not a coincidence because both of them worked together. And I think uh, when uh, Noyes discussed the patents that Johnny was. Uh, going to uh, file with a lawyer that triggered uh, Noe's ID to maybe go a step further than just uh, doing planar process for one transistor. At the same time, Jack Kilby then of TI invented a hybrid version of the integrated circuits. The first child patent, the one on metallization by Noe's was granted in 1961. The TI patent was granted in 1964. And only Kilby got the Nobel Prize in 2000, as Norris and Honey had died before. So in our opinion, um, you know, again, as process engineers, Norris and Honey were clearly uh, tremendous contributors, and Kilby certainly too. But uh, we kind of see the contribution of the two a little bit um, higher level. Um, I think one of the contribution of Gordon Moore and, and uh, Tom Rowe at Intel, which was not uh, as, as much publicized as the kind of uh, you know, process development that we saw in the trenches, which was so helpful for all of us in manufacturing. So basically, Moore we had a background of uh, a chemist who was doing his own glassware at uh, APL at uh, John Hopkins University in his first job. And so he knew very well that uh, if you doped uh, oxides, you can change the temperature of uh, melting or flowing. So his idea was uh, we had a big problem of uh, how, how to insulate the uh, silicon gate from the, from the metal layers coming over it, but without breaking this metal layer. because it, So the profile of the oxide, which was insulated, had to be managed. And this is precisely what uh, Moore succeeded in doing by doping the, the oxide with phosphorus, and then you could melt it uh, at low temperature. And so this, the, the oxide would flow over the, the polygate and would give you a smooth surface that the aluminum could cover. Uh, an additional you know, process step that also uh, was super important was the famous super dip, also developed by Tom Moore. There was a problem at uh, the contact edge, which cut into the oxide protecting the, the contact and gave very sharp edges. So again, the metal would break over these steps. And so this, this dip in a quick dip in, um, in a special oxide, special edge solution smoothened the surface and then the step was made. Aluminum did make the contact. These were supposed to be super secret, uh, you know, process uh, information. But uh, within weeks or days, uh, all the information was uh, common knowledge in all valley through various channels, including restaurants and so forth. But this was a huge strength of Silicon Valley because everybody profited from anybody on uh, on new steps forward, which was not the case when I was at um, use aircraft in Newport Beach. We didn't know anything about that this problem had been solved. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the beautiful work also on MOS stability factors by Snow, Grove, Deal, and Saar, and also the uh, tremendous work of Klein and Fagen at Fairchild to really put the polysilicon um, as idle MOS gate metal because of itself, the ability to self-align the source and drain diminishing the, the capacitance between gate and source and drain, and the excellent protection, sodium protection of, to the, for the gate oxide. Next, please. 
And then when you do technology development, sometimes you have accidents. And I think the you know the clever people can uh, look at these accidents and uh, and decide instead of trying to fight it, maybe do something with it. So it was what Dove format at Intel did with uh, things appear uh, some transistors which MOS transistors which exhibiting some memory function because of the uh, mal uh, was broken somewhere. And this led to the EEPROM technology, which was a fantastically profitable Intel business beside the microprocessor through 1985. Then the uh, probably the, the most important step without going through all of these different uh, was the uh, discovery by uh, the founders of IDT that CMOS silicon gate, two level poly and one level metal could be a very fast process. It wasn't just a low power process. It could be a very fast process. So they made unusually fast static RAM and this, this feat was duplicated by TJ Rogers at Cypress, which confirmed this new trend that the, that the uh, MOS silicon gate was gonna be a very, uh, CMOS was going to, Silicon Gate was going to dominate the industry. And this was further confirmed by the uh, development of metallurgy system, which in the beginning consisted of just two poly and one level metal to now be, uh, you know, 13 or, or, or 15 level of metal. This is basically due to the improvement of the ability to planarize the wafers because as as you deposit level uh, more and more metal in the beginning the surface was very rough and you couldn't do masking on it so some special equipment was developed called chemi chemical mechanical polish which is a very unusual uh it was really like uh, putting some flurry on a uh, slurry on top of the wafers and physically polish the surface like uh, like you do a mirror. For a process engineer, seems this seemed to be anathema in view of the fact you always try to get you know very clean surfaces, no contamination, no certainly no slurry. But the process was uh, was used and was very successful. Next slide, please. So. But besides just uh, you know inventing new process, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the process engineer were also very busy on uh, on uh, yield maintaining yields uh, stable. I mean, the, you would you could have in these days very easily a situation in which from one day you you get eighty percent on certain process or products. And then the next day, with the next wave was coming out of the line, would be have a few percent only. So this naturally triggered a massive effort on the part of everybody, you know, 24 hours a day and so forth. I already mentioned the first one, which was uh, 1969, when uh, Intel only had a few percent yield on its 1101 study gram because of a metal break in the contact step, which was fixed by uh, the super deep fixes of, uh, of Tom Rowe. I'll just mention uh, a, a couple more. I mean, at IDT, when I first joined the company, we only had a few percent yield on its famous 16 case static RAM 6116. And this was naturally a well-kept secret because of the sub-threshold N-channel leakage, which was not understood. We just couldn't figure out what, why was the N-channel so leaky. And that the problem was it was giving impedance of the N-channel comparable to the load which meant that the inverter, a key part of the memory was at undefined state. So this was not going to work as a memory. So it turned out that uh, an operator made an error, but uh, documented very well uh, her error. And so that a group of process development figured out that um, the cause of the problem had been all along that the ion implantation energy which was used to dope uh, the source and drain using the gate as a mask was too high so that the phosphorus ion would go through the silicon gate mask and then dope the channel even so slightly but that causes leakage so immediately you get a factor 10 uh, you know increase in in yields so you can imagine the, the relief and then uh, the last one was uh, when we visited the micron technology in Boise, 
they told us about also a big scare that they had in 1988. All, all the RAM products that was coming out of their line suddenly exhibited soft errors. The soft error is really bad because imagine you test the DRAM at the end of the line and it's good, but the next minute you test it, it's bad. So this is something you absolutely don't want. So again, working day and night, um, the process development team discovered that the wafers had become radioactive. So naturally, the radioactivity caused, you know, alpha particles caused the capacitor in the dynamic RAM to discharge. Now, why was why were the wafers radioactive? And so they discovered that there was a phosphorus, phosphoric acid which was used all over the process before to clean the wafers before diffusion. The bulbs were radioactive themselves. So upon, upon asking the suppliers where, what was what could be the problem, then the supplier discovered that uh, one of their suppliers of phosphorus had switched. Uh, had switched, they switched suppliers and the new phosphorus supplier had some small contamination of polonium into the phosphorus. And polonium is a well-known radioactive material. Next slide, please. So before concluding this uh, few remarks, I just wanted to point out a, a really interesting Darwinian selection process in the new semiconductor ecosystem that um, that existed in the you know early 70s. So basically in the early 70s, anything that could be designed and produced was sold. I remember in 1972 in the lobby of Intercell, you know, it was flooded with uh, buyers from uh, European and Japanese companies trying to get their, their products. So every time an engineer would come out of uh, a fab, you would be assailed by all these people wanting their products. The situation would naturally change quickly, both um, domestically because of the multiplication of uh, startup by uh, funding of VCs, um, and then uh, the natural competition from from overseas uh, started also. So pretty pretty quickly, the field started to divide into uh, you know a few few options to drive this business. I would say the first were the uh, product and process driven companies. I mean the Intel and AMD, who uh, you know, designed some very complex uh, standard products to help their customer systems, and these were, uh, you know, very. Uh, the focus now was more on product design, product application, and product engineering. And the the, key, the way the key, not the process engineering, the process, the engineering, the process development was really focused just to make these devices of higher. You know performance. So these you are know, talking about high volume uh, products and gross margin, which were at least fifty percent higher. And then the second kind categories of of companies were the one which were driven by star product designers, such as uh, David Fulaga at Maxim or Bob Dupkin at Linear Technology, and their application was engineering. So these preferred some older process that were very well characterized. And then they would produce, you know, unique products where they could charge whatever they wanted. So the volume was high, but the gross margin was incredibly high, more than 80%. Next, please. And finally, the third categories of, uh, you know, there were some people trying to compete on uh, performance and cost. Out of those, very few uh, succeeded, but one of them was really uh, extraordinary in micro technology, as you know, it's the only U.S. company left in the DRAM business. The only other ones are Hynix and um, Samsung Korean companies. So how did they how did they do it? I mean, so it, during our visit, we spent uh, a couple of days in in Boise, and we saw a lot of the founders, you know, the Parkinson um, Parkinson brothers and many others. But it was extraordinary how original, how different they were thinking, maybe because they had been isolated from the Silicon Valley. So they had their own way of, of thinking. It started with design. The design was optimized for yield, but also for size of the chip. Their size of the chip were always 40% smaller than the competition, even at the same node. And the second thing is that they, they shrunk these devices at least once a year. We had the case of the one megabit dynamic RAM, which was shrank five times between 1987 and 1991. And this is a major, major process, just not shrinking the mask. It's a lot more than that. 
But the most unusual thing to to uh, to learn was about the manufacturing process. All manufacturing process was made in Boise, uh, from the wafer fab to the packaging to the test, and even the burning uh, was included in in that. And the test, the final test, was made in the burning oven. Again, completely completely different. So that resulted in very fast throughput, but also incredibly good quality. Very quickly, these uh, devices were recognized by the military with DC and Jan Qual, and also by the commercial uh, you know, NCR, Northern Telecom, DEC, and, and Canon. And what was remarkable is that they constantly made an effort to simplify the process. This is something we never thought of in Silicon Valley. They cut mask, for instance, from nine mask and mask process in 1983 to seven mask and mask process, which allowed them to only have nine mask uh, CMOS process. This was like 30% or 40% less mass than anybody else in the industry. So this was you know tremendous uh, advantage in terms of cost. They also used all the equipment as long as possible, one to the one to the to the to try to to hide the modification that they made on the equipment when vendors were coming to maintain them. But the result of all that was the most amazing was that the turnaround time from taking the wafers out of the box, the way raw wafers to the cash from customers in the bank was 31 days. This six weeks in Silicon Valley took us five months to, for the same result. So you can imagine the advantage and the and the extraordinary effort and originality and creativity this represent. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Cannot hear you. Cannot hear you. We're not hearing you, Scott. Yeah, cannot hear you. Scott, we didn't hear you, but did you suggest that I should go ahead? Yeah, okay. Uh, I hope everybody else is hearing. Thank you. Uh, hearing you we fine. couldn't hear Scott, but I'm assuming he introduced me. I'm T.R. Reed. I'm a reporter. I am not a scientist. Um, and like most reporters, I'm interested in people. And I got interested in the story of the microchip and the semiconductor revolution when I realized, uh, this would have been around 1980 or 81, that it was two Americans who got the, who turned all those ideas David was talking about into an actual working object, the, the uh, <clears throat> semiconductor chip or the microchip. And I set out to meet them and figure out how they did this. Um, as I say, this was in the early 1980s, <clears throat> I don't know if people can remember the feeling now, but at that time, Americans were worried. We were worried about our economy and our technology. Yes. The Japanese seemed to be the stars of semiconductor and computer technology, Sony, and he, uh, all those companies were the ones we were thinking of. And it was kind of striking in 1980 to think that it was Americans who had launched uh, both the transistor and the microcomputer revolution. Um, when I got interested in Jack Kilby and Bob Noyce, I got so interested that I went to my boss, Ben Bradley, the famous editor of the Washington Post, and asked for a year off to write a book about them. And he said, well, what's your book about? And I said, well, I'm going to write about the invention of the semiconductor chip, the microchip that's at the heart of everything we use now. And he said to me, well, when do you leave for Japan? Because he too thought, as everybody else, mo many Americans did, that these ideas came out of Japan. Uh, as a matter of fact, these ideas came out of two Americans, two sons of the prairie, two uh, Americans who grew up and went to public schools in the heartland. Jack Kilby uh, 
was uh, from Great Bend, Kansas, a very proud graduate of Great Bend High School. And in the year 2000, when Jack won the Nobel Prize in physics, uh, the school board in Great Bend, Kansas, decided that they ought to change the name of their school to Jack Kilby High School because he was the only grad they ever had who won a Nobel Prize. And um, the one, the guy who stood up and said, no, this is terrible, was Jack Kilby. He said, no, nah, no, nah, I don't want my name on that school. You don't want my name there. It's got to be Great Bend High School because when we play East Wichita, we got to represent Grace Bend in, in Great Bend in football. Jack was from Great Bend, Kansas, as I say. Um, in 1941, I guess this is what you had to do then if you wanted to go to college, he took a train to Cambridge, Mass. to, took the entry, to take the entrance exam at MIT. Uh, and this is a guy who subsequently won the Nobel Prize in physics, who changed the daily life of the world with his engineering prowess. And guess what? He flunked the entrance exam. Jack did not get into MIT. And I teased him about this 59 years later. I teased him about this in Stockholm when Jack was there to get the Nobel Prize and I went with him and his family. And I teased him. I said, boy, I wonder how MIT feels now that you flunked their test. And he was still ticked off about it. 59 years later, Jack was still mad that, they, that MIT didn't let him in. Anyway, he went to the University of Illinois, he did fine. Uh, and then, as uh, David said, went to, um, and went to TI at a time when the problem of how to build the kind of equipment that people knew we could build was looming. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob Noyce was from Iowa. He was from Grinnell, Iowa. He was a smart kid, a scientist. Uh, good in science and um, and never really lost, neither of them ever really lost that kind of Great Plains down home American homeland kindness. Uh, the first time I ever called Jack Kilby when I decided to write a book about him <laughs> was I called him up in Dallas and said, hey, I, I'd like to write a book about you. And Jack said, well, why? Why? Well, you invented the microchip. You changed the daily life of the whole world. Oh, well, yeah, that'd be fine if you want to do that. Sure, I, I can find some time. And uh, I said, well, I, I, I think I'll come to Dallas next Tuesday. I'll take a plane to Dallas. And Jack said, you know, it, it's just tough as hell to get a cab at that airport. I'll, I'll come out and pick you up. Uh, I was the author. He was the hero, the subject, but he came out and picked me up. Bob Noyce, I went out to uh, Intel to meet Bob Noyce a couple of times and Gordon Moore and mentioned that I lived in Colorado. And um, Bob said, gee, I, I got a house in Colorado. I got a house in Aspen. Yeah, that's great. And maybe two months after I first met him, I was home in Denver and uh, Bob Noyce called me up and said, hey, I'm in, I'm in Aspen. Get your skis. Let's go. And I went out there and skied with him. And of course, Bob was... Bob was a guy who described himself as comfortable with risk. He liked taking risks. That's probably why he changed the world by inventing the microchip. Uh, anyway, we went out skiing at Aspen at Ajax, the main ski area there at Aspen. And I said, what's your favorite run? And he said, well, I, I guess my favorite run is Back of Bell. I don't know if any of you have ever skied at Aspen, but if you go to Back of Bell at Aspen, it has two black diamonds and it says caution, advanced, experts only. Bob Noyce went down that hill like nothing. I fell about 40 times. But anyway, he took me skiing. Um, so these two Americans who were engineers came up with this uh, solution. And when I was talking to them uh, in the 1980s, by then the microchip Semiconductor chip was a trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar global industry. It was in everybody's home and everybody's car. And I said to both Jack Kilby and Bob Noyce, gee, you guys ought to get the Nobel Prize for this. I mean, you changed the world with a good idea. And both of them gave me the same answer. They said, no, 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 no. The, the Nobel Prize, that's for scientists. That's for guys who do serious science problems. 
we're engineers. Uh, we, we don't do theories. We don't do equations. We, we, do, we solve problems. Our job is to solve a problem. And we're not the type of guy to get a Nobel Prize. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, finally, in the year 2000, the Nobel Committee came around to this. I think what happened is I was told when I was in Stockholm, uh, the Nobel Prize Committee in the, for the millennium in the year 2000, they were worried that they were giving prizes for such esoteric, uh, difficult to comprehend scientific developments that people around the world didn't really understand what the prize was for. So for the millennium, they decided to give their prizes to people whose work had actually entered everybody's home. And as David said, they, uh, Luke said, they don't give the Nobel Prize to people who are deceased. And so uh, Jack Kilby got it. Um, and Jack, in his Nobel Prize lecture, very, very generously named all the other people who he thought might have gotten it, including, of course, Bob Noyce. And um, one of the people I ran into in Stockholm during that Nobel Prize ceremony was Gordon Moore. Gordon Moore came out and said he just wanted to be there because if his friend Bob Noyce had been alive, he would have gotten the prize, which I think is right. And at the Nobel Prize lecture, the guy who introduced Jack Kilby said, oh, man, I mean, th here's a man who really changed the world. The integrated circuit that he invented is the heart of clocks, computers, cameras, calculators, pacemakers, palm pilots, deep speed space probes, deep sea sensors, toasters, typewriters, cell phones, internet servers. It's in everything. And uh, Jack Kilby then gave up, stood up to give his lecture. And he said, you know, uh, it always kind of bugs me when people give me credit for all that stuff. I mean, I, I'm just an engineer. I just solved the problem. And he said, you know, this is kind of to hear that it kind of reminds me of the story of the beaver and the bunny who were sitting at the base of Hoover Dam, Boulder Dam in, in uh, on the Colorado River. And the bunny looks up, the rabbit looks up at this massive dam and says to the beaver, did you build that one? And the beaver says, well, no. But it was based on an idea of mine. And that was how Jack felt about his country. Um, so my, my point is, and the, the, the book I wrote, uh, My Chip, How Two Americans Invented the Microchip and Launched a Revolution, This my publishers asked me to remind you this makes great Christmas giving. So... Uh, I'm sure your mother-in-law would be delighted to get a book about semiconductor technology for Christmas. And there it is. That's what you want to give her. Anyway, uh, the thing that interested me was that these two Americans, high school boys, public high school kids from the heartland, uh, faced this crucial question, which David and Luke have set up for us, and came up with a solution. And that's what made them happy. Uh, Bob Noyce became a billionaire. You know, he helped found Intel and became a very wealthy man. Jack Kilby never really cashed in very big on this invention, and neither one of them cared about that. What was important for them was there was a crucial problem facing the world, how to build these digital devices that people could conceive of in the 1950s. They could design them, but you couldn't build them because the interconnections of many transistors were too difficult to do. They faced that problem and their engineers and they came up with the solution and that's what made them happy. Jack Kilby and Bob Noyce, they changed the daily life of the world with a good idea and that's what they were always proud of. Thank you. Yeah, I hope I'm back with my audio. Can everyone? Yes, hear yeah, me? we hear you. Like, oh, shoot. Okay, I had to reset my microphone. I don't know what happened. Anyway, I apologize. Uh, uh, you know, you mentioned toasters. Uh, we have a computerized toaster in our house, of all things. But yeah, well, most and, yeah. people, anybody watching this, has what a yeah. hundred thousand microchips in his home. He's got another yeah. twenty thousand in his car. A uh, whole bunch in his watch. And his, I mean. 
they're everywhere in the world now. Yeah, uh, yeah. They were nowhere in 1958 when Jack and Bob first got the idea of how to make this thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, when my microphone was muted, I was just mentioning, I, I just wanted to mention before I, I introduced UTR that uh, uh, I'm putting up links to uh, our guests, various aspects of our guests, certainly by no means a complete set of links, but uh, please do have a look in the chat uh, box there so if you're interested in these in these sorts of things. And we'll be posting these on the in the comment section of the YouTube video that will come up shortly after we're done here. Um, and uh, I also wanted to uh, encourage people again to be submitting uh, questions either to Q&A or to the uh, chat. There, There's no reason to wait until we uh, go into the um, go into the Q and A period, which is where we are right now. Uh, the 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 first question uh, comes from Paul, and uh, I was worried that it was my um, computer that was internet connection that was messing up because the story that you were telling was a bit garbled. And uh, now Paul says that no, it seems to have happened with everyone. So he asked if you could repeat that story that you were telling. Yeah, we missed about the punchline. That was the best. Um, yeah, about, okay. um, Every, everyone saw it. Okay, yeah, yeah. So could what? you fill us in on the punchline? Of uh, what? Which well, story? the last story. The beaver you story. Yes, oh. the beaver story. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry you didn't hear that. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> the, the guy introducing Jack said, whoa, TV, transistors, telephones, toasters, space probes, deep sea probes, everything in our modern world is based on his invention. And Jack said, gee, I, it really bugs me when people say this. It kind of reminds me of the story of the beaver and the rabbit looking up at Hoover Boulder Dam. And the rabbit says, did you build that dam? Did you build that one? And the beaver says, well, no, but it's based on an idea I had. <laughs> so that's, how, that's how Jack Kilby felt about his invention. He just didn't feel he should get the credit. The one application that Jack totally was involved in was the pocket calculator. Uh, Patrick Haggerty, who was the head of TI, was always looking for practical, saleable applications of his people's work. And he, he went to Jack Kilby and said, okay, uh, uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take this office calculator, which was about the size of your desktop computer at that time, and it's going to fit in your pocket. And you're going to do it with your chip. And Jack did, and with two other people at TI, did, in fact, develop the first pocket calculator. Um, it sold for, I think, $14.95. This is at a time when office calculators were $90. And now everybody's got one. Um, so Jack did invent one important application, but all the others, no, he said, oh, don't give me credit for that. It's just my idea. Yeah, I remember the uh, first pocket calculators came out when I was actually a freshman in college, and uh, the two ones were Texas Instruments and Hewlett Packard. And of course, yeah, Hewlett Packard. Do you still uh, have your slide rule, Scott? I still have my slide rule. I found it yeah. <laughs> the other day while I was trying to clean out some boxes. But uh, you know, the 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 difference, of course, was that Texas Instruments was considered sort of the instrument for the people, whereas the guys with the oh, pocket right, protectors yeah. went to yeah. HP to the point where uh, my my chemistry professor then um, barred them from being used in class to, to figure out calculations because it supposedly gave people with the money to buy an HP calculator some advantage uh, over, over the others. That ban did not last long, <laughs> I have to say so. Anyway, so, um, all right. So again, please let me, um, uh, please let's go back to the uh, to, to the Q&A, enough reminiscences from me right now. Uh, uh, David Gibbons, during the, during the presentations, he actually asked a very interesting uh, question. And you mentioned that germanium was, uh, was an important part of the point contact transistor, I believe. Uh, he wants to know why was germanium so important? And it's really addressed to anyone who wants to. Uh, the most likely, uh, germanium had been used or refined and worked on for many, many years, particularly in developing radar detectors in World War II. So everybody was familiar with germanium. And the other fact is it, it, well, it's used at a much lower temperature um, and mm. it was faster. 
than mm. trying to use silicon or some of the other materials. However, silicon had major advantages um, later on with the ability to grow the oxide on the top surface and then use that to make all the interconnections. So germanium was okay. chosen because it was there, they understood it. Silicon was developed because it had some long-term advantages. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? I think silicon was hard to work with. Isn't that right, David? And that yeah, was it's, it melts at 1200 degrees C and requires so very different handling characteristics. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But the, you know, the major advantage of, of silicon was actually the band gap being much wider. So that means that you can work at higher temperature. I mean, where germanium ceased to be, a, you know, ceased to be a semiconductor and silicon, con, you know, continued. So. Hmm. I think that was a key, a key aspect, the band gap difference, right? Yeah, yeah. So a related question, uh, does germanium play any role in things like energy storage uh, or devices or things like that anymore? I mean, how, how important is it anymore if it's uh, been supplanted by silicon? I don't know of any major mainstream applications today. Look, you may have some more insight. Yeah. No? I think in RF transistors, it still plays a role, but I'm not an expert in that. Mm. Okay. All right. So uh, Tony Anadio uh, put up a question that I had actually written down <clears throat> on my pad during the presentations. Uh, Moore's law, of course, has been, it's a famous uh, law predicting the future. And of course, it's always a worry. Uh, are we going to bump up against the limits of Moore's law? Is that happening or is it just on its own? An endless onward and upward trajectory. If uh, ever people have been predicting that there's 10, 10 years left of Moore's Law. <laughs> and how long have they been predicting it? Uh, but for 50 years. years. <laughs> I mean, clearly we're reaching some very fundamental limits. We're working at the size of atoms now, and uh, interference yeah. between them gets much, much mm -hmm. tougher and tougher. But uh, by stacking oh, things on top of one another and other approaches, we continue to get the very high densities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you see uh, definitely on on two D level. I mean, uh, flat surface. You definitely see a slowdown of the of the progress compared to uh, you know the eighties and the nineties, and that's why you generate three D um, you know three D structures in which you pile stuff on top of each other and, and and with advanced packaging. So it has you know it it has slowed down. I mean the, the progress. So is it, you know, it's it's hard to look at a graph like that without being impressed at the regularity over several orders of magnitude. And, and uh, you know, we can we can certainly appreciate the limits to it. As you mentioned, Luke, there's only so much surface area, but then we're getting down to the level of atoms in some cases and uh, uh, computing with single electrons going from place to place. What was the fundamental driver of, of this incredible regularity of, of packing transistors on it? I mean, it wasn't it's, exponential. It was it's simply it was I mean, a power it's simply, curve. Uh, you know, it's simply, then it's really uh, process engineering. I mean, uh, equipment, you know, both equipment became progressively uh, better. I mean, you start with uh, the first node in 65, with, as I said, 10 microns. So that's a minimum transistor size, right? Mm -hmm. And then... Uh, and it was depending on the optics. It was depending on you know, the quality of the optics, depending on the quality of the acid of the photoresist. And all of these things together improved considerably, you know, uh, over the years. So it was little step by little step of engineering work. But, but it fundamentally, the the, yeah. sorry, the, the real driver was the competitive nature of the industry. Yes in mm. terms of there were so many companies that had a piece of the action, everybody wanted to make the next leap forward. So Moore's law is more a self-fulfilling prophecy of everybody working hard to try to outbreak mm -hmm. the competition. And it continues today. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you finish the 16K, everybody you know, was uh, joking to be the first one to do the 64K and then 256K and so forth, right? I mean, mm -hmm. so, but but it, how it was made is just incremental process development ideas and equipment. I mean, the equipment manufacturer also played a huge role in, uh, you know, in, in helping, which is also a totally, by the way, mostly an American, uh, mostly an American uh, still business, except for ASML, which is the, the Dutch uh, optical, you know, uh, Mask makers. I mean, 
photolithography equipment. So, Scott, I'll interrupt and tell you, I'm, I'm going to have to leave you now, but thank you very much no. for the opportunity to talk. It's been a great presentation. No. I enjoyed you. meeting well, thank all you of the other thank uh, contributors. Thank you. Thank you, David, for joining us today, um, and uh, good luck. I uh, just wanted to make you know one more comment as to the okay there was you know slow slow little step progress but in uh, when I bought I think uh, it was 1973 I bought the top state of the art photographic equipment for masking uh, facility it cost ten thousand wow. dollars right. now uh, if you talk about the top of the line ASML uh, lithography system. I'm not sure what the price, but it's like 100 million or something like that, you know. So it's, you know, the wow. usual. And the fab also a fab. You could do a fab in the 70s for maybe one or two million, as you all know. You know, a fab today it's 10 to 20 billion, right? So it's hmm. it's been progress, but uh, not many people can now really start their own with a fab. Hmm. So that kind of runs counter, doesn't it, to the uh, to the usual uh, trope that uh, that uh, the more um, innovation you get, actually the 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 competition at this cutting edge uh, tends to drive prices down. But you're actually saying that the device is cheap. The device is is has yeah. gotten cheaper, but the equipment to make it is, is not. I mean, it's. You know, it's a tremendous uh, issue when you build a 20, uh, mm. 20 billion fab, you have to amortize it over five or six years. So you better you better have the, the right product and the right process uh, to be able to do that, right? But no, yeah. the, the, price, the price, if you look at the price of silicon compared to any inflation or anything like that, any measurement, it's incredibly uh, low and decreasing. Mm. Not only for transistors, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, we're going to run up and uh, some kind of limit to Moore's law. That line is going to start to to flatten out a little bit as we run out of space. So, so what do you see as the as the uh, uh, the breakthroughs that are actually going to allow Moore's law to continue on its upward trajectory? Well, I, I mean, so so that's a very good question. Um, you know, being a venture capitalist, I'm submitted IDs all the time uh, as to, you know, how, how to break the, uh, break this problem. So, uh, you know, the microprocessor uh, was an ID to, to have a programmable uh, unit, which could, which could make basically any function that were made before with ASIC, you know, custom made circuits. So you could you you'd have a much bigger market because that microprocessor could do everything uh, by just programming and software. So a new approach starts, but but the, but there is a cost to it. There is a trade-off. I mean, you have a lot more um, intelligence packed in if you want in one device, so that it can do many different uh, applications. So the, there is a new tendency now to go back to uh, maybe more specialized circuits. But they are made in a different way, and that's where you see the appearance of these chiplets. So the idea of chiplets, you do very small chip, which are two millimeter by two millimeter standard chips made with the most advanced technology. And then you put, you know, five with five or ten of them of these chiplets, you can do almost any circuits you want. And then the only thing you have to do is interconnect them. So they, they have a special transposer chip which has a, a in, in, uh, which integrates the connection between these chiplets. And that allows you to supposedly uh, what companies come to coming to us say instead of you know a, a ASIC now a classical ASIC taking 50 weeks to be made to get the first samples. No I'm, I'm mis uh, misspoke 100 weeks to get to get, or, you know, two years to get um, to get done. You can do it maybe in eight weeks with this kind of technology. So you have a, you know, instead of, I mean, there's all kind of different ways that people find ways to to beat the um, slowdown of the, of the most low. So then effectively more laws continue as you all say, right? But not on 2D and not the way. Yeah, yeah. 
was there's been moving. some talk lately about quantum computing and uh, and how does that how does that fit into the level of innovation that uh, that could keep Moore's law going? So I don't know. <clears throat> Too bad that David is not there here because he has probably a better perspective. But yeah. quantum computing is a completely different uh, board game. I mean, it's. Uh, is it still based on semiconductors? I mean, I'm totally ignorant of, of the mechanics of it. Is it still based on semiconductors? It's well, yeah, there are some. There are semiconductor uh, chips in it, but it's uh, it needs to be at uh, at low temperatures, and so it's uh, very complex and uh, a completely different architecture, completely different software. Yeah. But you see, yeah. uh, you know, you see uh, tremendous progress here. Yes, uh, we see all all companies yeah. coming, ever more, ever more so clever ideas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly, you know, the changes of technology have have been a factor in this. But then there's also the the uh, willingness of people to take risks and uh, and and innovations. And of course, that's that's tied into a number of other. Kind of socioeconomic uh, issues, and uh, this uh, leads us into Tony Anodayo's uh, next question, which is: uh, He asks, "Are there uh, younger engineers and scientists coming along in the industry, and how have the cultural sources of inspiration changed?" And one of the complaints I hear, or comments I hear from a lot of my fellow academics, is that the nature of students has actually changed dramatically over the past couple of decades, and. Do you do you see a similar kind of thing in the industry of of uh, semiconductor technology? I mean, is a you know there the, there's certainly innovation going on, but do you see the pace of innovation actually keeping up with the uh, with uh, with what it could be, for example, or what it might have been 10, 20 years ago? Well, I I mean, okay, I was in a fantastically uh, expanding uh, time, but when you look at what uh... The MLAI uh, world is, I mean, this is incredible too. It, it's just going at a speed that's, uh, you know, and uh, and I talk to young engineers and young uh, managers trying to start their company, and they're as enthusiastic as we ever were. I mean, uh, the spirit is there. I mean, it's, it's going to continue. Now, where does it go? That's, you know, you have social, social yeah. uh, ethical problems with that, yeah. but it's, it's definitely there. I mean, yeah. Tiara, do you have any thoughts on oh, that? Dozens of companies in that, in yeah. that area. Uh, a trend that is disturbing to me is this concept of um, rating colleges and rating college majors based on how much money you can make when you get out. Uh, the Wall Street Journal is now doing uh, annual ratings of universities, and their criteria are how much does a first year graduate make? Um, and that kind of mitigates against somebody going into physics or going into electrical engineering um, when you could go into financial engineering or something or finance <clears throat> and make a lot of money. Um, it, it, it bothers me that universities are cutting back on humanities and um, basic science programs to focus more on majors and studies that could lead to making a lot of money. So that's disturbing to me. <clears throat> My The two guys who invented the microchip, Bob Kilby and Jack Noyce, as I said, they had high school calculus. They studied engineering in college. They were trained to be engineers to solve problems. And if if nowadays the the thrust in American colleges is to train people to make money, Maybe we're going to lose that the drive that led to the microchip. I, I mean, I think that's a very good point. Uh, you you have, except I can only talk again as a venture capitalist. You know, the uh, the founders and the engineers still have very uh, low salary. I mean, in the beginning uh, startup, you don't. I mean, the venture capitalists do not tolerate you know high salaries and so forth you get stock options right i mean so but you're right to point out that this is a wrong way to look at the university yes yeah 
Yeah, this is certainly an area of concern of us here at the NES, which is what has happened to the universities over the over the past 20, 30 years. And and TR, you're absolutely right. You know, we've 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 seen a transformation of the culture of the university. Uh, and again, it's geared mostly around maintaining flows of revenue, you know, in terms of reduction of standards for students, uh, uh, in terms of what's rewarded and those sorts of things. And of course, the sciences are not immune from this. The humanities are, are really kind of taking it in the gut. I've seen proposals from people to to just do away with humanities departments altogether in some yeah. colleges as, yeah. a, as, a, as an institutional survival strategy. And you know, when I, I've, I've read a little bit about William Shockley. I think he's quite a fascinating character. And, uh, you know, um, uh, those people weren't really involved in universities all that much. And of course, you know, the question is to, to my mind is uh, just what are the universities doing? You know, and is this going to be a source of, uh, of, of things running into, uh, running into the ditch for universities, so we end up spending a lot of money for not very much at all. And uh, so the engineers and and uh, the people that come into these firms are are they sort of um, uh, keeping universities at kind of arm's length? You know, I'm thinking of Peter Thiel's proposal to all right, I'll I'll give you five hundred thousand dollars to not go to university, but to mm. develop something interesting. You. Are the universities really helping the development of of uh, semiconductor technology and innovation, or are they mostly standing in a way? I don't know what's happening in California. Uh, I was on the board of Princeton, and Princeton's put a lot of work into um, micro technology, AI, et cetera. Um, I'm I'm hoping that this this concentration on how much money you can make the first year out is just a phase. And maybe in a few years, classics majors and English majors and civil engineers will be trendy and popular again. I hope so. Um, but as I say, this concerns me. I, th I think in California, aren't the universities doing micro computer, micro technology kind of work? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, at least when I was, when I was at Caltech, and I'm sure it continued, I mean, you had uh, wonderful professors like Calvin Mead, you know, who played a big role in, uh, in fact, uh, training uh, students for Intel. And there was a very uh, intense relationship, relationship between Gordon Moore and, and Caltech and uh, yeah. many of these universities. So the, there was a tight, uh, I mean, the, all Silicon Valley companies were aware of the need to absolutely have the you know, and Berkeley is also, UC Berkeley was very active in, in, in various ways. They had several professors and often in, uh, it, it tended to be more in circuit design, architecture, you know, of, the, of, uh, of products rather than process development, which, you know, got taken over basically by, by industry and their huge uh, R&D departments. But the new concepts of new microprocessors, you know, uh, risk or, you know, AI and all that, it's, it's driven a lot by universities, not just, um, so it, it is, there is, a, the symbiosis continue. I mean, I, I'm not worried about that. Yeah, I think in places like Silicon Valley, the Research Triangle in North Carolina, around yeah. Cambridge Mass, Route 128, around Route 1 in Princeton, New Jersey, around Cambridge, England, uh, the as you say, the symbiosis, the the interchange between those startup companies and the universities is very strong. That's why Research Triangle is there, is because of Duke and the University of North Carolina. But the humanity question, I think, is a very good one. Uh, personally, I was educated with uh, Latin and Greek and so forth, so um, a little bit attuned with that. But um, I also wrote a book recently about the Marshall Plan. And I was at the party um, in Maui, uh, Thanksgiving, and uh, to my, uh, I was aghast to realize that people who were 60 or 70 years old did not know who George C. Marshall was. Mm. Several people did not know. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, the architect yeah. of, of the victory of World War II is not that far. Right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
if you lose yeah. if you lose connection to you know yeah to humanities in general you are losing a lot i mean it's uh, yeah. yeah yeah you know uh, if 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 this is just an engineering problem then you know and and i think it was you luke who mentioned uh, that 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 the engineering mind is geared towards solving problems you give a problem and then the person or, or the team of people comes up with a way of solving it and this is something that industry can do quite well as we've seen you know and and uh and if the universities have any kind of claim on on a role in this it's it's either to provide a home for innovative people or but 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 universities to ask them to become basically r and d laboratories for private companies is working against a kind of uh, creativity and innovation and so forth that the universities hold up as being their principal product. And so I wonder if, um, you know, to, to what extent have these kind of quirky ideas that just kind of come out of the creative mind, uh, inspired by things in the humanities, to what extent uh, has that actually fueled innovation? And the example I can think of, of course, is Norbert Wiener, who was a very, very deep, um, deep thinker, uh, very solidly grounded in the humanities, had some interesting, innovative ways to going about that. But I'm less familiar with what goes on in semiconductor technology and the kinds of developments that you have been speaking about. Can, can you give us an example of a kind of a quirky, strange idea that just came out of nowhere that really transformed the course of of this industry and the development of this technology? Hmm. I mean, in other words, what role has humanities or the arts or whatever played in in the development of this of this technology? Well, I, I've spent a lot of time in Japan and China. And, you know, they have this incredibly complicated alphabet. It's not an alphabet. They use uh, kanji or characters. Uh, <clears throat> China routinely uses, people routinely have to know about 4,000 kanji. In Japan, where they're more structured, they have ruled that 2,136 kanji make you literate. And all the newspapers stick to those. But it's a big problem, and it's very difficult you know, if you have a 27 stroke kanji, you can't, there's no sound attached to it. So how do you even look it up in a dictionary? Guess what? It's now a piece of cake. Uh, I have a device. Is it here? Yeah. My brain. This is called my brain. And um, I can either write the kanji on the screen here and it tells me the pronunciation and the meaning, or I can take a picture of it and it will tell me the kanji. So here is a, a classic kind of daily problem that bothered people for hundreds of years. And uh, this new technology has made it really simple. And it's a big problem. I, I was just in Japan and uh, educators there are worried because you're supposed to memorize all these 2,136 kanji, both reading and writing. And now a kid can just look on his watch and figure out what the kanji is and they don't have to memorize them. So it's kind of like uh, when my kids were young, the question was, should we teach them long division? I mean, they could always get the answer from a calculator. My argument was, yeah, yeah, damn it, they better know that. Should we teach kids how to find a square root? It's going to be right in your calculator on your watch. Uh, and but but the problem of discerning a kanji that you can't quite read in a magazine or newspaper is now solved by these devices. Hmm. Hmm. As Tia was speaking, you know, I I thought of um, in the semiconductor, you know, the, I mean, to get you were always confronted with very difficult situation, right? And and, and so uh, to get the maximum out of people also. I think the people who were most successful were the people who were able to motivate uh, their, you know, their crew down to the operator. And, uh, you know, so the human aspect of uh, that it can only be taught by uh, humanities, how, how are people responding? How are you going to get the maximum outputs from them? How do you take care of them? You know, how do you care for them so that they, suddenly an ID comes and it comes from you know in my experience it was coming from 
the top engineers, from the operator, from the technician, from, uh, so it was only a question, did you give you know these people the right forum to speak, to feel at ease, to uh, you know express what they really wanted to say, so so that their creativity would would come out. So I think humanity has helped me a lot in understanding the you know the how to get the most out of out of out of your workers and make them comfortable. I think that's you know one thing I can come up with. Yeah. Yeah. I've uh, I've had some conversations with uh, with with some people who've spoken of the of what they call the new trivium, and of course the trivium is the is the foundation of classics, education, rhetoric, grammar, logic, and and uh, uh, one person in particular speaks about the new trivium as 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 centering around our 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 technologies of communication, and he says the three trivia. Are alphabetic languages, um, uh, pictographic languages, of which Japanese is one. Uh, TR that was a fascinating example, and then a digital language, and and that the, 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 these are going. You need all three to be able to um, to to be a, uh, uh, a a an intellectually well rounded well rounded person, and we're being hurtled uh, at great speed towards that right now with the development of artificial intelligence but this example you gave tr of a, of a machine that can actually help uh cut through the translation of these of these characters um it's a double edged sword isn't it you know it can it can actually ease the learning of an of of all these pictographs but on the other hand it's going to uh, sort of undercut the immersion of students into learning these things. I mean, there's something to be said for the deep immersion of learning these these more than two thousand uh, different different characters. And and of course, the worry is similar with the advent of AI. You know, will people know how to write anymore if you have a machine writing writing uh, writing the things for you and writing perfectly sensible things for you? Although AI does sometimes, Chat GTP, for example, <laughs> often makes ma makes things up if it doesn't have a good knowledge base. So, so, you know, th this, this raises the question, are we kind of hurtling towards Oh, we lost you again, Scott, we're not hearing you. Uh, we lost you. Well, in, I'll, I'll take up on terms of AI. Uh, I am one of the plaintiffs, and maybe look as too, in the Authors Guild suit against ChatGP. Because if you ask ChatGPT who invented the microchip, they come up with whole hunks of my book. My book. People are supposed <laughs> to be buying this book. Uh, I didn't. I didn't write it to give it away free. It's hard work to write a book, and but Chat, and, and that's what ChatGP does. It scours books and feeds it all out for free to people. Um, and that's why I'm sure they're doing that to Looks Book too. And um, that's why the Authors Guild has sued them. And I'm one of, uh, I think, 15 plaintiffs. There you are. I bet that's on, they, they've taken <laughs> that too. Yeah. Uh, I'm one of 1,500 plaintiffs suing uh, AI, ChatGP for putting this on AI. But if AI obviously could have a lot of fabulous advantages for mankind, but if it includes stealing my books and giving them away to people, that's not a, a helpful uh, evolution. Yeah, but diagnostic, uh, you know, breast cancer um, with a non-biased opinion soon enough is something that I think AI can do very well. But yeah, there are many applications that's not going to be pleasant yeah. yeah okay apologies everyone oh am i back yes okay yes i, th I think i am back okay so apologies <laughs> everyone for that uh, snag i just said I'd hope some artificial intelligence could solve my microphone problem, but it appears this <laughs> yeah, certainly yeah. magically did. <laughs> so, all right. Well, we're at the end of our time right now. And uh, 
uh, before I uh, give the floor over to uh, TR and look for their final thoughts, let me just uh, mention that we're a uh, th this webinar series is funded by the or supported by the National Association of Scholars. So we welcome you here. Um, if you are already a member, we uh, certainly thank you for your ongoing support. And if you're not a member, you might want to consider joining us if you enjoyed this webinar because it helps support these 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 kinds of these kinds of things. And so, um, TR and Luke, uh, it just remains for me to thank you for joining us and to turn the floor over to you for any last thoughts that you might have. Uh, let's start with you, TR. Uh, well, my thought is what I frankly already said that the invention of the microchip in the late 1960s, 1950s, excuse me, by these two Americans from the heartland changed the daily life of the world. They improved life for just about everybody on earth. Uh, and that's a, just one example of what careful thinking and engineering efforts to solve problems can do. Uh, we have a lot more problems, and I hope the engineers and the doctors and the philosophers are working on them, too. Merry Christmas. Luke? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, to present ideas. I think such form is really a fantastic uh, idea to be able to exchange uh, ideas and always enriching. So I really appreciate the opportunity, as I appreciated this time in my life where I did participate in this fantastic uh, <clears throat> fantastic growth of uh, microchip by actually making it. And we were definitely aware that, you know, something special was happening, but it was, so it was extremely exciting. Uh, and we spent all kinds of hours and so forth and uh, to make it work. So thank you very much for this opportunity to be at NES. Thank you. It's a fascinating story and uh, Merry Christmas a, also. A consequential one. And again, a Merry Christmas for to everyone uh, coming up and uh, just remains to bid everyone a good day. Thanks again, guys. Thank you.